Welcome to part four of this seven part series on the GM8L90 transmission. And in this section, I'm gonna cover the electrical operation for this transmission. And in this presentation, we're gonna look at the wiring schematics, go through some solenoid operation. We're gonna look for software updates and I'm gonna show you how to go through and do that using a website that GM has. We're gonna talk about the solenoid calibration using the PUN, the part unique number that's found on the valve body. Also mention some of the adaptive control and how to reset adapts on this transmission. Look at scan data. I'm going to compare scan data from a snap-on scan tool and a GM scan tool to see if there's any missing components in the snap-on. And uh, look at the temp sensor. That's a kind of an area of concern on this. Seems like a lot of these units end up setting temp sensor codes. We're going to look at the three speed sensors, mention the two different mode switches that we have, and then also kind of talk about the external TCM. If you're familiar with the 6L80, it's got the internal TECM. The 8L90 doesn't have that. They actually have a separate external mounted TCM. Starting with this harness, this harness actually comes in three different sections or pieces when you take the transmission apart. We've got this pass-through connector right here, it goes up to that connection. And then that connection has our solenoids and our temp sensor. And then we have a third connection that goes to our speed sensors. Now this first wiring schematic that we're looking at deals with all the solenoids. You can see all these boxes right here are all the different solenoids they've got in this transmission. And this dashed line that goes all the way around is the transmission. So that means everything in here is internal to the transmission. You can see right there it says automatic transmission. So all these solenoids are internal to the transmission and they receive power from these two circuits right here. And that comes from the transmission control module. Most wiring schematics are set up so that power is on the top, then you've got your loads and then grounds at the bottom. So you're like, the ground is also controlled by the TCM, the transmission control module. So we get power supplied to the transmission control module, and then individually these solenoids are ground controlled. Most of them are pulsed with modulated, and they're controlling the operation of the solenoid, which we'll look at here in a minute. So this is the schematic that represents all the solenoids. In this wiring schematic, we've got primarily data communications, the temp sensor, and the accumulator solenoid, the start-stop accumulator solenoid. That keeps the transmission pressurized with oil when we come to a start-stop, engine shuts off when you come to a stop. And the data communications, you always notice with GM, they're big on this, they deliver two CAN bus wires coming in, and then they turn around and deliver those two wires going out to the next module. They kind of daisy chain them in through there. So the like colors, like this blue wire here and that blue wire there, that's part of the same half of the CAN network, and the white wire is the other half of the CAN network. They've got this ignition sense switch here, and that is going to be a wake-up signal. Then right down here, we've got our fluid temp sensor, and this temp sensor is an NTC. As the temperature increases, resistance decreases, we'll look at that a little bit later. And now for that start-stop accumulator, it receives its constant power source here from the fuse block. And then its ground is going to be controlled by a module, typically either like an ECM, PCM, or maybe even one that's geared specifically towards start-stop technology. So every time you come to a stop and it decides to shut the engine off, they're going to go ahead and ground this circuit out so that way the accumulator that accumulated that fluid pressure while the oil pump was running and so forth, that once you've come to a stop and the engine shuts off, now you don't have that oil pump operating, they can deliver that fluid pressure through that solenoid and kind of keep these circuits primed. This schematic right here focuses on the speed sensor. So I've got my intermediate shaft speed sensor, my output speed sensor, my input speed sensor, and then this portion of the circuit is the mode switch. When we're shifting between our different ranges, park, neutral, drive, reverse, all that stuff, this changes its output to toggle voltage properly on these wires that are feeding the TCM, so the TCM knows what manual valve position you're in. And depending on what year vehicle you're working on, you might actually have a four-wire sensor as opposed to the 10-wire sensor that we saw on the previous schematic. So here we have a range reference chart similar to the clutch reference chart that we've got, but in this case it's showing where the solenoids are hydraulically on or hydraulically off. So this is going to be where it says on or off, it's going to refer to the hydraulic operation. Up towards the top, we're going to see the labels for the different solenoids they got in this transmission. 
you could see they've got seven solenoids. And these five solenoids right here that are kind of in that light blue, those are the ones that are responsible for the clutches. And then these are on off type solenoids that kind of direct pressure. So they, if you want to know what solenoid they're referring to, it's either going to label out the gear that it's used in or label it out by its clutch or solenoid control. Like here we see S1, S2, S3, S4, and S5. That means it's going to control clutch one, two, three, four, or five. And like I said, that's the uh, gear that those are actually used in. So when we look at this table here, we can see, and it kind of makes sense if we've got the gears listed up here, when these solenoids are hydraulically operating their clutches. So like I said, this is the hydraulic operation, the ons and offs. If we've got a normally low solenoid, when this says on hydraulically, that means it's on electrically because in order for a clutch to be on, on a normally low solenoid, we'd have to energize it. Whereas on like a normally high, if that clutch needs to be on, like if we go to second gear, that's hydraulically off, but since it's normally high, meaning electrically off, it has pressure, that means that solenoid would be electrically off in this position because it's kind of the inverse of what we're seeing here. Normally high would be no power, hydraulically on, powered up, hydraulically off. So hopefully that makes sense. And these solenoids are all pulse width modulated, the ones that control the clutches. And they modulate these solenoids, pulse width modulate these solenoids to control current through it, but also control the position of the valve. And it's very important. That's how they control the quality of this shift. And as I've mentioned before in other videos, since this transmission utilizes clutch to clutch shifting, meaning as they, as they shift gears, they need to release a clutch and apply a clutch, which means they have to have the proper overlap. We can't release a clutch too soon or else we'll get a flare and we can't release a clutch too late or we'll get a bind. The same thing holds for applying a clutch. We can't apply a clutch too soon without binding it and we can't apply a clutch too late without causing a flare. So we need to create a nice little crossover there where a clutch is releasing pressure and then the applying clutch is applying and there's a slight amount of overlap to let us pull RPM down. And then by the time we get to the RPM we need, the releasing clutch is fully released. So they do that through computer control of these solenoids and precise computer control of these solenoids to get that clutch to clutch feel perfect. And using the speed sensors, they're able to adapt this transmission over time so that those clutch to clutch shifts are precise and perfect. At least that's the goal. On this illustration, I'm showing the location of these different solenoids. We got S9, the S8 solenoid, those are two on off type solenoids. S6 is our line pressure solenoid. And then we have our S1 through five plus S7, which is torque converter clutch. So those are torque converter clutch solenoid. And then our S1 through five are located here. Those are the ones that are responsible for their clutches. So the S4 solenoid is gonna control the C4 clutch. The S3 is gonna control the C3 clutch and so forth. On this chart here, I pretty much identified that. You can see here they, the, the solenoid ID. They do have these little labels on the valve body, A, B, C, D, and so forth, and that kind of corresponds with their label. And then the function on what clutch they are applying. Like I said, if it's an S1, it's controlling the C1 clutch, which happens to be the 1278R. It's normally high. Now this is interesting, if you saw the hydraulics lecture, you can see that some of these solenoids are fed with AFL, some of them are fed with line pressure. They all have pretty much five ohms of resistance, at least the pulse width modulated ones, the on off ones are around 12 ohms of resistance. So hopefully this chart kind of lays out its functionality. We've got our solenoid uh, ID, where it's at in the valve body, what clutches it's controlling, whether it's normally high or low, what it's being fed, either AFL or line pressure, and then the electrical resistance, the resistance of these solenoids. So if we have a unit that's on the bench, we're limited on all the different things that we can check. Uh, we can check resistance. In the vehicle, we can go through and look at the scan data and make sure the amperages, uh, the desired and, and actual amperages for each solenoid are where they need to be. But on a bench, we can basically, we can check the resistance of it. We could energize it, pump air through these, uh, the valves, energize it and make sure it passes and traps. But that really doesn't do a thorough job because with these things being pulsed with modulated and regulating the amount of current flow through it, they don't have to just pass and trap fluid, they have to actually control it properly. So unfortunately, without sophisticated and advanced equipment that 
I don't have and most likely a transmission shop's not gonna have, we can only do kind of rudimentary tests of like checking the, um, you know, the resistance of it and maybe just turning it on and off, and making sure it's, it works at its limits or extremes. So as a simplification on how this solenoid circuit works, as you can see, we've got a TCM and it's gonna directly control that solenoid electrically. And they have these tiny little solenoid accumulators that are dampening the operation of the solenoid. We covered that in the hydraulics video, even covered it in the overhaul video. And there's, this is an area that wears out a lot on these transmissions, so you wanna kind of focus on that. And then that solenoid is gonna directly control a valve, a regulator valve for that clutch, either the C1 through five clutch or the torque converter clutch. It's gonna directly control the pressure to that clutch. So you can see how important all the elements are here. We gotta have sound solenoid operation and the pressure going to the solenoid's gotta be good, either AFL or line pressure. And then the valve has gotta be free to move and have, not, have no excessive leakage around it. And then of course the clutch circuits and the fluid paths going to the clutch have to be good in order to get a quality shift. And this is the layout that we can see. And you've got a spring, this tiny little spring here just kind of works in addition to the pressure that finds its way through the tip. This is all covered in the hydraulics lecture. The solenoid, we've got AFL pressure coming in here, and then depending on how the solenoid is operated, it's gonna deliver fluid pressure out between these two O-rings, and that's gonna find its way through the valve body and expose itself to the end of this valve right there. That valve is gonna work up against any pressure that this valve is letting into the circuit plus that spring. I know you can't see it here. Like I said, it's covered really well in the hydraulics video. The line pressure is gonna find its way to that clutch circuit. And when it finds its way to that clutch circuit, there's a hole that goes through the middle of this valve and gets on the spring end. So it's gonna keep continuing to feed line pressure to that circuit until it builds enough pressure to overcome whatever the solenoid's pushing on down here. Once it overcomes that and can push that valve down, it'll cut itself off and we won't build any more pressure. So um, hydraulics video covers that in depth. I'm sure you get a good solid understanding if you've already watched it, you already know it, but the solenoid is responsible for taking AFL or line pressure, depending on what it's being fed with, and delivering that pressure to the end of this valve so it can operate that and do its thing. So on this slide, we're looking at a test driver snapshot from an 8L90, and here I graphed out the solenoids, uh, solenoid, well, solenoids one through five, and those are responsible for a C1 through five clutches, so we get to see how these clutches are being controlled during their upshifts and downshifts. And this is, a G, this is from the GDS2 scan tool. It's not perfect, it's a great scan tool, but there are some quirks and I couldn't figure out how to change some things. Like for example here, this is the gear command and I couldn't reorder this. It's like, can't read that very well from here, but I think it says first, fifth, third, I don't know. Um, it's out of order. Basically what I couldn't do is get it to go first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. Didn't want to go in order. I couldn't rearrange that. Very frustrating. But uh, so here in blue, when you see that on the side, it, the stair steps are goofy. Like first goes all the way up here to second, then down there to third, then up there to fourth. And fifth. you know, so it looks goofy, but that's also the reason why I went ahead and put these labels here just to show you what gear we were in at these given times. So right across here, we shifted, it was a downshift from third to, sec, uh, third to first, and then we shift from first to second, second to third, third to fourth. It really jumped from second to fifth, but it had to hit third and fourth along the way. That's why this part here is so tight. But you know, you got eight speeds. It doesn't necessarily, it doesn't make sense to always operate and upshift in every gear. But because of the way it's designed, it might need to hit certain gears and get the valves moving and circuits primed and all that stuff to make that thing shift like it's supposed to. So you saw a real quick skip shift, if you will, from second, third, fourth, and then it wanted to get into fifth. Same thing here, jump sixth, seventh, and then wanted to get in eighth. So if this was in its perfect prime, it probably would have rather have gone first, second, fifth, and eighth and just been a four speed transmission. But, um, you know, it just doesn't want to work that way. So anyway, this graphs that out. Over here, I got my legends. So if you're looking at the different colors, you can see green is uh, clutch one, red is clutch two, yellow is clutch three, purple is four, and light blue is clutch five. And to let you, you know, just kind of keep us straight in the mind here because there's a lot to think about. We've got our solenoids one through five, which operate clutches one through five. 
and what gears they're operating in, and then also whether they're normally high or normally low. Okay, so let's look at this 3-1 downshift. So right here, I'm in third gear. Right there, I downshifted into first. You can see the gear command in blue, where I've downshifted from third to first. So in this little section right here in the middle is when the solenoids are doing their things to pretty much get the clutch pressures properly when we're shifting from third to first. And what happens when we shift from third to first is the C1 clutch applies and the C4 releases. If we look at my chart up here, the C1 clutch is needed to be applied for first, and the C4 clutch is on for third, but not for first, so that released and this applied. Now the C1 clutch is a normally high solenoid, or the C1 solenoid, is the S1 solenoid is normally high solenoid. So in order to get it up to apply, they need to electrically turn it off. And that's what you see happen here in green. They turn the solenoid off, and that is applying that C1 clutch. And the C4 is also normally high, but they need it to release, so they're going to have to actually turn it on. And that's what we see here in this kind of a purple color here. They bring it on and apply it. So kind of a different way to look at things. Now, you can actually see the overlap that's occurring here. You could see where this solenoid was going from electrically on to electrically off. And you can see they kind of stall it out here and pause it and do a little ripple effect there with the amperage. You can tell they're likely doing that to control the pressures as they're applying that clutch. The same thing holds true for the releasing clutch. It kind of hangs on there as well. So that's what's going to allow us to control the overlap and get the clutch feel the way we need it. And now on the next slide, we're going to look at the 1-2 upshift. So that's going to occur right between when we're in first, we're operating first gear, and then boom, we shift in the second. So this little region right here is occurring uh, my 1-2 upshift. So you can see what's happening is our yellow pressure here is the C3. It releases pressure. And then our purple pressure, it also looks like, I mean, electrically, it's releasing. It's dropping current. But since it's normally high, we're turning it off so that way we can hydraulically turn it on, if that makes any sense. So we need our C4 clutch to apply, and since it's a normally high solenoid, we electrically turn it off. And we need our C3 clutch to release, and since it's a normally low solenoid, we need it to turn off. So you see these two dropping right there, but they're controlling the apply and the release of the clutch. And when ju jumping over here, I didn't want to cover these like these quick shifts because they're obviously we're looking to get from second to fifth as quick as possible. But going from the fourth to fifth, we're looking at this wind, this little section right here. So the C3 applies so that we see yellow kind of build itself up into pressure there. Current flow increases. And once again, yellow is normally low. So in order to get that clutch to apply, we need to energize it. And then the C4 clutch needs to release. And it's a normally high solenoid. So it was on when the pressure was low. And then they energize it to turn it off. So hopefully that's making sense. You know, I'm, I know there's a lot to look at on the schematic here on these drawings, but I'm just trying to reinforce that the, the way the computer controls the solenoids through current to control the pressure, it really also depends on if these solenoids are normally low or normally high. Another term for that is inversely proportional or either proportional or inversely proportional. If it's proportional, it means it's Electrically off, hydraulically off, and electrically on, hydraulically on. You can imagine the current and the pressure ramps that kind of go up together. Inversely proportional, which I kind of like those terms better, but inversely proportional means electrically off, hydraulically on. And then when the current increases, pressure decreases. I mean, it does, they operate the valves the same way. It's just where are they starting? With electric, current flow through the solenoid to turn something off? or no current flow through the solenoid to turn something off. So hydraulically, they operate the same, but electrically, it's just going to be different whether or not, it's basically how they're controlling the valve in the solenoid. And I just include this slide because it shows shift time and pressure. So you can look at the pressure. This is just that long test drive, and you can see there's the pressures are all over the place. It's as low as 70 PSI under a lot of um, situations. And then, and this wasn't crazy driving by any means, but you know, we were jumping up to over 200, 250 PSI or so at different moments. And every one of these little sections is a 
time of last shift. So that's the reason why it's not kind of a smooth signal. It's like there was a shift and then it equated to a time, let's say four tenths of a second. And then the next time uh, we got a shift, that number changed a little bit, but it was like maybe 0.42 seconds. And then the next shift, oh, that was quicker. It was 0.27 seconds or whatever. But the scan tool gives you the ability of looking at the time of the last shift. Every time it shifts, it will give you a, uh, a shift speed. And they can figure that out by looking at your input shaft speed sensor and your output shaft speed sensor to figure out how quick it went from the previous ratio to the current ratio. And to change that shift speed, they can really do one of a couple things. They can operate the solenoids for the clutches in a different fashion, or they can change the line pressure, the overall line pressure, because the overall line pressure that's feeding the regulator valves that are going to the clutches, and then the solenoids are controlling those regulator valves. Well, if I change the amount of feed or input to those, I can ultimately change the pressure that goes to the clutches. So to kind of reiterate that, the TCM is going to control the clutch feel and apply through that pulse width modulation. And every one of these solenoids in this valve body kind of has a unique flow rate. They want to be so precise with the operation of these solenoids and even the valve body and the valves in the valve body that they assign these different circuits and solenoids a, like a, a flow rate or a calibration. And then this assembled valve body is going to have what they call a part unique number or pun and that pun is going to be labeled right there on that valve body so that way you can enter that when you're programming the TCM to let the TCM know that this valve body has these flow rates and the TCM has this lookup table with all this different kind of way it can decipher that pun number so it can figure out what the different flow rates are for all these different solenoid circuits and the reason why they're doing that is they want to establish a baseline like this is what a normal transmission with all the right clutch clearances and everything sealing the way it should if i put this valve body on there with this flow rates of valves i could start at this point right now and i might just have to do minor tweaks but otherwise it should shift fairly well if i have a lot of variance in the construction of these that changing out a valve body that's completely different it's going to make the computer work a lot harder to um, adapt to that new valve body or that new valve that is kind of out of the range that it was expecting. And these solenoids have these different numbers on here, like that one there says 2280, the last four that says 2281, this is 2282. The newer ones actually even have like a little triangle etched into them that show that they're the updated solenoids are different. So uh, you don't want to get these mixed up. When you pull these solenoids out, you want to make sure the same solenoid goes back into the same spot. So it would be a good idea to label these when you're taking this apart, either to do uh, just to clean it out or to do measurements on it or to ream it out and put different valves in there or put a kit in there. Make sure the solenoids go back into their same spots. Very important. So programming this TCM, and this TCM is typically located by like the brake booster on a, on a pickup truck, and you're going to want to check for updates. and. When you're in the data stream, you could pull this configuration data off. And like right here, it's got all these different, that says the date of last programming, which was probably the original programming that it got from the factory. Then it's got all these different uh, part numbers. And right here, you can see like software module one identifier, module two, module three, module four, and so forth. And if you look at that, it says AA. Well, as, you, as these things get programs, those will increment up. And down here, you can also see this CVN or calibration verification number and that number right there is the last calibration that it got and if you calibrated it again if you updated it you'd end up getting a calibration number here and it would go down the stream if it's just all F's that means it's never been calibrated into that category or it's never seen an additional calibration so how do you figure out if it needs to be programmed you can go to this website right here uh, you can google GM calibration ID and you'll find this website too but it's the tis to web service.gm.com, tis to web This is a video of me going through that process. So I entered the VIN, I'm going to scroll down, we can look at all these different modules. But that says transmission control module, next. I'm going to pick programming, next. Normal, because that's what I am, I'm normal. Next. And then that is the RPO for this transmission. And you can see all these different 
uh, labels here. It says operating system, transmission, diagnostic system, and so forth. Well, right now it's operating system. You can see all those were listed. And what we're doing is we're looking at those last three digits and they match up with what we've got. I know this says software module one, two, three, four, five, but basically treat this top one as one, the second one is two, the third one is three. If you hit complete history up there, which I don't do in this video, it would show you like a whole, like on one sheet, show you everything that it's got. But by clicking through here, if there's a little chain of versions and so forth, you can see where you're at in those versions. So I'm just going down the line and pointing out that all the different part numbers, they match up with the part numbers that we have here. So he was actually all up to date on this one. There was no um, available update, but it's worth checking. It's free. It doesn't take anything, really just a little bit of time. You go to that website, put the VIN in, and then you can go through and verify that you've got the latest software. The neat thing is, is if you aren't, if you don't have the latest software, you can see a lot of times a list like here that says a bulletin and you know false DTCs and all that, you can see maybe it's related to the issue that you've got, the whole reason why you're working on it to begin with. So as you just saw, if you're putting a new valve body in this transmission, or if you're replacing the transmission, the programming is gonna ask you for that PUN or TON. And that PUN number, part unique number, that's the valve body number, it's etched onto that valve body. And that TON number is the transmission number and it's part of the sticker on the outside of the transmission case. You can't find the PUN number anywhere except on the valve body. So you'll need to get in there and, and pull the pan down to at least get to that PUN number if you have to. So when you go to program the PUN and the TUN, you need to use a capable pass-through device. And I was using the GM MDI, that's their dealer tool, but you know the Drew Tech tools and the Snap-on and all that kind of stuff, those tools will allow you to do it you're basically reprogramming, just like you'd reprogram a normal module. So after you're done programming and you install a new valve body and transmission, you're gonna to wanna to go through and perform a fast learn, and do some clutch adapts before you deliver the vehicle to the customer. And some technicians have found that the fast learn works great, but going through and doing individual clutch adapts or what they call return spring adapts, that they don't really work out that well. So they just drive the vehicle and you'll see a chart here coming up that kind of gives you instructions on how to drive it in order to get those clutches to learn. So here we see that PUN number. You can see it's etched right into that little accumulator on the outside of the accumulator bore on the valve body. And then this is that sticker that's on the outside of the transmission. That's the TON number. And as you probably saw in some of these other videos, like the overhaul video, that number contains a lot of good information, like when it was built, the Julian Day, the model, and so forth. So that number is beneficial to us to look at uh, for determining um, if we've got like a core or something like that, when that core was built and if maybe if it has uh, updates, but it's also the ton number that we'd be using to program into the TCM when we do a transmission change. So in this little video clip, I actually go through the process. I, you go to the AC Delco website. This is AC Delco TDS. And we've got a subscription here for that. So access the subscri subscription. If you don't, you're gonna wanna have to pay for uh, the three-day subscription or whatever it is. And basically, you're gonna, that's gonna allow you to use your either your GM, MDI, or it will allow you to use an aftermarket pass-through device to connect to the vehicle and perform programming on modules. So to look at this, I went through and I clicked access and I click my launch, tech line connect, it goes through and checks to make sure all my software is up to date. Then I'm gonna go over here to well, okay, I gotta pick a vehicle or, or connect to my vehicle. So it's connecting to it, found it, it says Silverado up there. You can see I went to SPS2, Service Programming System 2. It's validi validating the files. And there I've got my vehicle. And I've selected reprogram. You can go over there and hit the, the little tick mark. Goes through and does a little menu features there. I'm gonna scroll down on this and pick Transmission control module, because that's where I'm at, what I'm doing, right? And this says uh, MCVM operations. Up here, I wanna go and pick my transmission. I've got the M5U right there, and that's what uh, we selected. Click that little there button. And then I'm picking replace valve body, but you can see it replace transmission and then refresh characterization data is up there as well. That's the PUN number, so it's pointing out like, oh, okay, Go through and find your PUN number on your valve body, and then you're gonna type that in up there. Now I did put a used valve body part number in there, one I had on a shelf, 
and uh, it took it. It worked fine. So you can see I hit next. And it's going through and it's retrieving the vehicle data, looking at all the, you know, the zeros and ones are flying in everywhere. It's like the matrix going on, getting programming data. And then boom, it shows up. Okay, these are the software that you need and this is the, the version number. And if I click next, it's gonna basically give me a summary of what our software is gonna end up being here. Like this is the current, this is selected. This is what it's addressing, if there's any bulletins or why they've got this latest software. And then at this point, I would hit start programming. If you look over here, it says start programming. And at that point, um, it would go through the process of reprogramming that TCM with that new Val bodies characterization data. I, like I said, I have heard of shops. They've gone through and put used Val bodies on, you know, if they've got like a known good core and they had a transmission they suspect has a bad valve body, you can go get a used one and put it on there and go through this process. And that's doable. It'll work. It might not, transmission might not be fixed because who knows if that valve body is uh, any better, but at least you've taught the transmission control module the characterization of that valve body. So now that you've gone in and installed your new valve body, you install, or maybe a transmission, or you rebuilt your transmission, you're gonna wanna go through and clear your adapts. You're gonna wanna do the fast learn and then deal with your clutch adapts, drive the vehicle so that way it's ready to be delivered to the customer. So the fast learn clears the shift adapts. And if you did individual clutch learns, they kind of recommend you do a fast learn. If you still have a quirky shift, you can do an individual clutch learn. And the individual clutch learns will deal with either the clutch itself or the clutch return spring. And they want you to perform those individual ones if the fast learn didn't completely make it uh, satisfactory. But they recommend don't do the adaption to kind of cure a transmission that came back after 5,000 miles. It's got a weird shift. Don't perform the adapt because it's likely gonna go back to driving like crap again. So, so looking at that table right here, this shows all these different shifts and which clutches are responsible for that. So that way, if you're going to do individual clutch adaptations, you're gonna to wanna to focus on these clutches. Like if you had a one, two shift issue, you might wanna relearn the adapt for the C4 and the C3. If you had two, three issues, do C3 and C1 and so forth. You've got that all the way down. And that little table there just kinda of gives you a little cheat sheet on uh, like, okay, I've got an issue with a shift. Which ones do I need to adapt? They can drive the vehicle though. And a lot of technicians prefer to do that as opposed to learning the individual clutch adapts. They've got better luck with it. So. This table here covers the clutch, what shifts they're responsible with, how you learn the pressure and the volume, and if there's any kind of notes that might help you, like cruise control is helpful or maintain a throttle at this. Those are things that are gonna help you achieve that adapt through driving it. And like I said, tech, some technicians have told me that they actually like to do this method better because the scan tool method doesn't seem to work well for them or doesn't cure the problem, but this does. So that's C1, 2, and 3 right there. Might get out of the way. You can screenshot that. And then this is the C4, C5, and then garage shifts. And of course, depending on where you live, some of these might not be very practical anyway. Uh, you might have to live in a spot where you don't have the ability to drive really slow for any length of time, or maybe the ability to maintain a certain speed for any length of time. But hey, the information's here, so you can use it if it helps you. So can a snap-on do what the GDS2 does? Now, I'd venture to guess that not that many aftermarket shops are gonna have a GDS2 scan tool, maybe less than 5%, but just about everybody has a snap-on tool, it seems like. But can a snap-on do what the GDS2 does? Well, we're here to, here to look. Now, this is the filming this in the summer of 2022, and it's the latest version that snap-on has. So under functional test, I did have output controls where I could control some solenoids, and I did have the ability to reset and do my fast learn and do my resets, adaptive resets. But what I couldn't do is do the individual clutch adaptives, either for the return springs or for the pressure or volume learns. None of that stuff was available, only the fast learn. Now, as far as data is concerned, now this is using that ShopStream viewer, which is a free download from Snap-on. So you could take your files from your scan tool and look at them and graph them and just kind of organize them also on a PC which I think is really handy. 
but the, they had a list and the PIDs that are available were pretty much the same that was on the GDS2. Can't really think of any of them that were on the GDS2 that I didn't have available on the Snap-on, so that's really good. Plus, the, the software is really nice on the Snap-on to be able to go through and graph and record. Maybe you didn't realize it, but on your Snap-on, you got a picture of a, of a save button up top where you can go through and save a movie, which is basically just a recording of all the data PIDs during that test drive. And in this case, on my, my um, Snap-ons, it uh, has 4,000 frames, so it can capture up to 4,000 frames. Once you go beyond 4,000, it just starts rewriting the earlier one. So it keeps a buffer of 4,000 frames, and when you open it up, you'll be able to view those 4,000 frames. So I think that's pretty handy. Now the GDS2, every time you open it, it automatically saves that session. So you don't even have to go through and ask to save a movie or a recording. It's just going to do it anyway. So here I am zoomed in on that same Snap-on data list and just kind of pointing out some of the stuff that they have here. Like I mentioned, pretty much the same as the GDS2. If you look here, I got some of my engine speed. Now this vehicle wasn't moving, it was just in a stall in the bay in the shop. There's a gear ratio PID right there. As soon as you start moving, that number would become kind of live and active because it actually is using the speed sensors and telling you what the actual gear ratio is. And going through down the list here, I got my speed sensor voltage, it's okay. Gear command, that's what gear they want. So the, it's gonna tell you the TCM wants first gear, whether you're getting that or not, it's to be determined. My internal mode switch, that's, a, that's giving me the indication of whether I'm in drive, reverts, neutral, manual range. And that's the state of the five circuits that they've got, low, high, high, low, low. And as I'm switching between the different ranges, you'll see these numbers toggle and switch. And that's the actual voltages that it's picking up and whether or not those voltages are valid or not. So that's kind of nice to know. My engine coolant and transmission temp, I don't think that's right. It says calculated line pressure, 730 PSI, probably not. And uh, then we've got our current for the, I'm just showing here is one through four. It's uh, indicating the current through the different solenoids. We saw that on the GDS2 and that crazy graph, and, but we could graph that out on here as well. So yeah, the Snap-on scan tool provides a decent amount of PIDs. And like I said, they are um, pretty much equivalent to the GDS2. So this little video clip here covers the GDS2 and some of the options that we have on the menu structure here for GDS2. And I'm gonna start out with this configuration reset. And you can see we've got this uh, transmission service fast learn. So just like the Snap-on tool that was available, but under the clutch learn, we did not have this on the Snap-on where we can go through and select individual clutch volume learns or the spring return learns. Here I'm going to the clutch one volume uh, learn and these are the different conditions that the vehicle needs to be in, which none of them are met. I need to be doing the 6-7 upshift, and I gotta be over 55 degrees Celsius, third, uh, 10 to 30% load, and, um, you know, or actually throttle, and then I also have to be between 55 and 355 load. None of those were met, so same deal with the return spring. I have to meet a lot of these criteria, and if I don't have that criteria met, then it's not gonna let me do that learn. That's probably the reason why a lot of technicians prefer to just drive the vehicle. They haven't learned the old fashioned way. So under control functions here, you can see these are the different output controls I've got. I can either deal with the solenoids or the torque converter clutch solenoid or you know, the, the drivers, the high speed drivers. This is a data list. If you scroll through here, you can see that this data is really not that much different than the Snap-on data that was available. We've got our voltages for our mode switches, whether they're valid or not, this is the current for the different solenoids. And there's the torque converter clutch data. So it's gonna pretty much just rearrange that list so that you're looking at the torque converter clutch information specifically. It's kind of a weird PID right there. It's saying that the driver requested axle torque is like 23,000 Newton meters. I don't think that's accurate. That's gotta be coming from somewhere out in left field. Under shift data, for some reason, it won't let me get into that. And even under solenoid valve data, it won't let me get into that either. So it's, uh, there's still some quirks, I guess, with this software, but the Snap, as you can see here, the Snap-on and the GDS2, other than those clutch adapts, pretty much offer the same information. So as far as that temp sensor is concerned, they actually do have an information bulletin that extended the warranty on it to 10 years, 120,000 miles. 
And basically what it does is it has you go in and replace that internal harness because the, the temp sensor is built into that harness. It doesn't unplug separately. It's kind of assembled in there when they manufacture it. So the fix for any temp sensor related codes to go through and replace that internal harness and they've had to do enough of them to the point where they extended the warranty to 10 years, 120,000 miles. If you already did this repair for a customer and charge them, you could be a hero and contact them and get reimbursed for that. So looking at this temp chart for the temp sensor, you can see as the temperature goes up, the resistance goes down. That's why we call this a negative temperature coefficient. They go in the opposite directions. Temp goes up, resistance goes down. If you're monitoring the wire, that's between the transmission and the computer, you'll actually see the voltage go down because the resistor that's in the computer, as the resistance on the sensor drops, more voltage gets dropped on the resistance in the computer so that you've got less voltage left over on that wire. The computer looks at the voltage that's on that wire to determine the actual temperature. It doesn't look at resistance, it looks at voltage. So, but as that voltage drops, that corresponds through their little lookup tables to an actual temperature. And that's how they figure it all out. Pretty simple. So looking at these speed sensors, here's that harness that we were just looking at. That right there is the input speed sensor. Then I've got my intermediate and then the output. And the input speed sensor plugs into this guy and reads off of that ring that fits around the C3 clutch housing. And then towards the back of the transmission case, I've got my intermediate speed sensor. It reads off of a tone wheel that's on the the planetary four internal gear, planetary three carrier assembly, it's kind of one combined unit, they call it the intermediate speed sensor, and then the output speed sensor. So to see these sensors in action on a scan tool, I've got this graphed out, if you remember, this is a GDS2 recording and the gears are not in their order right here, so that's why this thing jumps around a lot. Um, that's first, second, third, fourth, fifth, six, seven, eight really goofy, but couldn't figure out how to straighten that out. And then our other, um, like this green line right here, that's our input shaft speed. You can see it's climbing up, accelerating for, and then every time you shift, you got the engine RPM dropping, right? And then this one in yellow down here is our intermediate shaft. So that's showing the speed of that rear internal, or the P4 internal and P3 carrier. And then in this reddish, this dark red, that's the output speed sensor. So we can kind of see their relationship to each other as you're going down the road. Taking a little closer look at how the speed sensor works, you can see I've got nine volts from my TCM feeding that speed sensor. And then the output signal finds its way back to the TCM. This is a two wire sensor, but it's not like a conventional two wire sensor. This is like the, the same type of sensor they use on the 6L80. Uh, it is a magneto resistive type sensor, which means it creates a square wave output We'll see that here in a minute. You can't test this like you would test a typical two-wire variable reluctance type sensor where you're expecting an AC output voltage. On those, you can just use a DVOM and use an ohmmeter and actually check the resistance of the coil. There is no coil in these. It's a solid state, it's a circuit that's uh, got its own little logic built into it. So it receives its power and then it delivers a signal on the output wire and what it does is it's got a couple power supplies built into these sensors and when they're exposed to a, a ferrous chunk of metal or exposed to an air gap it's going to turn a power supply on and off and that changes the amount of amperage that flows through the output signal circuit there and it's very small amounts of current it's milliamps like it switches between like 6 and 13 milliamps so you're not expecting much of a change you can bench check these, and I'll show you that here in a second. But I just want to point this out that these three sensors, they work a little different. They're two wire sensors, but you can't check them with an ohmmeter. Uh, if you want to check them, you're actually on a bench. You're going to have to actually go through and power the circuit up and uh, use a DVOM or a scope to check it. And I'll show you that here in a second. This is that little sub harness that they have for the three speed sensors. And I've got the pins here. I've kind of labeled them. So we've got pins one and two are our output speed sensor. Pins three and six are intermediate. Pins four and five are our input speed sensor. If you were to try to wire this thing up so you can actually bench check this, that's how the pins are labeled out. One, two, three, four, five, six. And like I said, two, three, and four are nine volts. So if I wanted to power this up, I need to power 
two, three, and four with nine volts. You can use a nine volt battery to do that. And then my output speed sensor is going to be circuit one. The input speed sensor is going to be circuit five. And my intermediate speed sensor is going to be circuit six. So using a DVOM in the milliamp scale, you can put it in series with these output signal circuits and rotate it real slow. And you'll see the amperage toggle up and down about six milliamps. And if you use a scope, you can put a, a resistor, like a 10 ohm resistor in line and monitor the millivolt change. I'm gonna go ahead and show you a video on what I'm talking about right here. So these sensors right here, they're two wire sensors, but they're not like your traditional variable reluctance sensor that when you measure it has like 1200 ohms of resistance or something like that. If you actually check the resistance of these, they have very high resistance. So you can't check them with an ohmmeter like you would a conventional two wire sensor. Sometimes you'll hear these referred to as two wire Hall effect, but they're actually magneto resistive sensors so what happens is nine volts get delivered where these red wires come in and they get delivered to these sensors. And these sensors are basically little mini power supplies. And then when they're exposed to something fair, something that uh, will attract the magnetic flux lines, they'll trigger on another power supply and they'll add to the current. And then when they fall in an opening, then they will shut that power supply off and they'll reduce the amount of current so they'll be basically changing the amount of current on this output wire. That's why it's only two wires. We got power coming in, and then that second wire is going to be a signal wire, and it changes the amount of current every time it passes one of these windows. Or in the case of the intermediate sensor, it passes the tooth ring on that uh, fourth planetary internal, third planetary carrier. And then in the case of the output speed sensor, on the um, parking pole assembly. So how do you go through and check that? Well, we can use a scope or we can use a DVOM. And what I've done is I've powered up with a nine volt battery, I've powered up those three wires and you could check them one at a time, but I've got this set up where I'm, I can check all three. And then I've got three wires coming off my three uh, speed sensors. Now these resistors right here, I'm not gonna use at first. I've got them on there, but that'll be used when we check with the scope. But if we're gonna check it with the DVOM, what we'll do is we'll set this meter up into the milliamp setting. So I got it at milliamps and I got my leads in the milliamp setting. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hook one wire up to the ground and the other wire I'm gonna hook up to one of my signals. And you can see in this case, and I'm gonna go ahead and hook up on the other side of the resistor. It doesn't really probably matter much, but and hopefully you can see right here, I've got 13.81 milliamps. Now I'm gonna rotate the input shaft just a little bit. You see it drops down to 6.3, a little bit further, back up to 13.81, then 6.3. And as I rotate it, I'll be switching it between those two amperages. That's what the computer reads to figure out the shaft rotation. I can do that on all my sensors and that'll give me an indication if these sensors are doing their job. And that's how I could check it using a DVOM. I could just watch the amperage change. I can use a scope to do this, but since scopes don't measure amperage directly, I need to do something to co convert the amperage to a voltage. And I can get an amp clamp around these wires if I wanted, but they'd have to be one of those micro amp clamps because we're, we're only dealing with six to 13 milliamps. We're not dealing with much current flow at all. Or I could do what I did here, and I'm putting these little 10 ohm resistors at the end. What I'm gonna do is have these go to ground on the other side of the resistor, and then on the front side of the resistor, I'll measure the voltage. So the voltage is going to change because it's gonna be dropping across this resistor. So as that second power supply turns on, I'll see the voltage go up. When it turns off, I'll see the voltage go down. So I can do that on all three of these channels. Please excuse all the mix match colors and leads and stuff I've got here. I'm not very organized today, but I've got my three signal outputs and I've got the three channels of my four channel scope hooked up to it. I hooked up one ground lead because this scope that I've got right here, it, it combines all the ground. So I really only need to have one ground. I got the others there, but I didn't need to hook them up. So. And now we could see our scope pattern. 
And as I rotate this input shaft, since all three of these gear set parts are rotating, I get to actually see all three sensor signals actuate. With this picoscope, I can separate them if I want. I can clean the signal up. So you can see these speed sensors test out perfectly fine. This is just something that you can do if you were doing a bench job and you wanted to verify that these speed sensors work. You could actually wire it up and use it, either use a DVOM and check the milliamp switch, or if you have a scope, you can actually hook it up to a scope and monitor the actual switching on the scope to see if it's doing its job. So that about does it for this 8L90 electrical operation. And in this video, we looked at how critical the operation of the solenoid is to get the proper shift feels, the proper shift quality, and how to go through and use the PUN, the part unique number, to program the characterization into the TCM. And also look at updates, software updates, and the TIS2 web website that you can go through to check to see using a VIN number if you've got the latest software already in your TCM. We looked at our three speed sensors, the temp sensor, and also talked a little bit about the externally mounted TCM a little bit different than the Tecum that we're used to seeing in the six speeds. So thank you for watching this video and look out for the next one, which is going to be on torque converter operation. And I'll see you there. Thank you.